Ok. Es que dice. Ulrika, Eder. Hello there. Can you hear me? Hello, Ulrika. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, Ulrika. Can you hear me? 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 Can no one prata. Can you speak? Are you Can asking you? me? Yes. Are you asking me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, I thought you were speaking. Yeah, you can hear me, right? It's, yes. Uh, Ulrika, yes. can you speak? She's connecting still. Hmm. Ulrika. For me, can you speak? Um, hi. Hi. I Good. To log on to the internet. Very good. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear ah, you great, now. Great, good. I now it, it was my computer. Ah, okay. <laughs> that was uh, problematic. Oh, no, finally. Okay. Good. And here in some towns with me, but she's putting yeah, her computer <laughs> online. So very welcome. I'm very happy that we could make this webinar. And now we have some minutes to start organizing ourselves. As you know, you have the questions as well. Mm -hmm. What I thought was that I'm going to start with the introduction to the webinar and explaining as well what is GADIP, which is the main organizing entity here. And then I will go and present you very, very briefly. It's, uh, I think that you can complete your presentations when you start speaking, each of you. And then after that, we go to the questions that I send you. And then uh, we, we take the questions in order. Hello, Mabel. Hello, how are you? Good You're morning. Fine. Good to have you here as well. Yes, very I'm not nice. very well, but yes. still alive. With these so, vaccines, it's terrible, the reaction. Oh, terrible. But I, I'm, I'm very glad you could make it anyhow. Yeah, yeah. So, and here is Anne as well. Okay. Hello, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm recording. Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, we are going to okay. have to mute. Maybe I'll mute. Yes. Uh, I will. Uh, make a record of, of the whole session, the webinar session. And I hope that as well, we can make also some text version, at least in Spanish and perhaps in French, if we make that possible. So you will have the link to all the session uh, afterwards. And, and I think it will be a, a, a very interesting session as well. Uh, so, uh, do you have any questions up to now? No, uh, one of my doubts is, as I was reading what Priti said, I'm not sure now if we are going to be answering the two questions together, first and, and second, or each one. I'm not sure. What do yes. you think? Uh, I'm, I thought, uh, and I told Priti as well, the first question is mainly uh, Anne and Ulrika, but you are free, all the three, to have any opinions or reactions to what they say, uh, Anne and Ulrika. And the second question, uh, 
I think that um, it, it was also, and Enrica, what is what was the foreign policy as conceivings we had to do? And then uh, this, the third and the fourth question, it's all of you, because it's about what is the difference with any other yeah. foreign policies and how was the idea of a feminist policy developing the end in other areas of the world. And of course, all of you are invited to, to, to develop all this. So it's mainly the first two questions, you could say it's, um, we will have mostly Anne and Ulrika, but you can also react to those questions, to what they say. And the uh, third and fourth question then is mostly you uh, from, uh, it's for me, Mabel and Priti. Okay. So, Edme, uh, yes. what I have is because you wanted us to share the impact of uh, feminist foreign policy, what we are seeing in our country and what we are, uh, you know. Uh, yes. So, that uh, uh, is one part of the response. And mm. I can share that after the first question presentation from our uh, uh, from Ulrike and Anne, huh? or mm -hmm. I can do it after they do the second uh, uh, presentation also in terms of the various components of the uh, foreign policy. Um, yeah. uh, as you think would be best at me. So that was my question. Like I first thought that if uh, Mabel and uh, myself, we are responding to what we are hearing about the Swedish uh, feminist foreign policy, then we should hear the whole presentation. And then we come and we talk about uh, various impacts as well yeah. as any components of it uh, uh, that we are observing in our country or in our region or in our work. I don't know how you feel. Um, I think uh, the second is the best, uh, Pretty. To come after that we second listen, is best, right? Yeah, that we yeah. listen to what they say and then we right. react to that. But if right. we are doing separate, I think it's going to be some problems because maybe what we are saying first is later on need to be adding something. So I think right. the best is to listen and then react. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, Edme, is that okay if Mabel yes, and I yes, come course. after the second question? We make our in intervention then. And then third and fourth, of course, all four of us are speaking, right? Like, you know. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That is okay. That is okay. The, the, this, wait, just, we are having some technical problems waiting I for host. Uh, I think this is a practice session. Because uh, we're in the practice session. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, then perhaps we start after the practice. It will yeah. work after the practice. Do that oh, yeah. again. Uh, you have to see this, hey. Since we're in a practice session, once we want to start at six, you press this. Uh, and yes. that's when the rest of the like uh, participants will be able yes, to Yes, because join. we are in a, special, in a special room that's supposed to have all the facilities and all the finest <laughs> technical <laughs> adjustments. So we can have public and we can have everybody. Yes. Are we going to receive questions from the public? <laughs> Sorry, Edme, I want to ask something. Are we going to receive questions from the from the public or yes, yeah? as well. oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And okay. we uh, there were uh, several people registering uh, up to yesterday, I don't know now, um, we had about 65 people that had registered okay. for this webinar. So perhaps it's more, now we are having public coming in. So we, you, and you are supposed to be able to see the public uh, when we start the webinar and to see us. So uh, I hope it all works. We have been training on this 
facilities okay. and I hope it works <laughs> because it's a little bit sophisticated. But uh, is it no? It's five minutes left. Uh, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. I will. I will start it so people will start coming in. So let's start. Yeah. Yeah, they host in a recording in progress. And you should be Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Now, yes. Now, yes. Before, no. Okay. So, Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. You can hear me. Yes. Okay. Good. Oh, it is some of my. Can you hear me too? Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, that's great. Yes. Good. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Men, men, men kamera är där, inte här. Min kamera är också här. Han är där också. Men ja, där. Jag ser dig. Ja, Aha, men inte där. Stora bilder. Den där kameran letar nog efter ljudet, tror jag. Nej, men det är den jag kollar på nu så jag tänkte Aha. att vi skulle kunna se oss på. Ja, det var ju istället för att se publiken. Ja, 
Jag ska inte med dig. 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 Det är inte så mycket. Det är inte så Det är inte så mycket. 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 Det är so. Okay. Okay, perhaps we start. Very welcome to all of you who have come here and all to, to our panelists that accepted to participate. I don't have a microphone because with these all these techniques, but can you hear me? <laughs> so uh, I will try to raise my voice uh, and uh, as I said before, very welcome to this webinar on feminist, uh, feminist foreign policy and uh, to, this is an event organized by GADIP, supported by White Plus and Gothenburg University and GADIP is an association based in Sweden that's trying to make it easier the exchange of knowledge and experiences between research and activists, focusing on gender perspectives in global development issues and international relations. So uh, now I'm going to make some, a very, very short introduction to this webinar. In 2014, the Swedish Read, a red green coalition government adopted a feminist foreign policy which signaled a substantial change in its external conduct. It pronounced that ambition it was to become the strongest global voice for gender equality and full employment of human rights by all women and girls, women and girls. Sweden's feminist foreign policy platform also signaled very strong support for resolution 1325 <laughs> adopted by the United Nations Security Council in 2000 as well as related resolutions on women, peace, and security. Margot Ballström, a top diplomat with past experience as the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, was <laughs> the main initiator of this whole idea. On numerous occasions, Ballström has emphasized both the link between women's participation in global politics and sustainable peace and the notion that women's empowerment impacts in a positive way on national and international security. Nowadays, while the Swedish government has taken a step back and rejected to associate its foreign policy to feminism, a growing number of states, including Canada, Norway, Holland, Spain, Luxembourg, Mexico, Germany, France, and Chile, have adopted gender and feminist informed approaches to their foreign and security policies. In order to evaluate and discuss the implication of feminist foreign policy in general, GADIP, and uh, supported by Y Plus and the University of Gothenburg has organized this panel. So I will pass to present the participants, the panelists today. First, we have Ann Towns, the only one here today, a professor in political science at Gothenburg University that has an extensive work on gender and international relations, in particular on the Swedish feminist foreign policy. 
Then we have Ulrika Grandin, uh, which you have there, and it, which is the operative head of UN Women in Sweden. And then we have Mabel Bianco, Women Major Group, Argentina. Priti Dakota, who's the global coordinator of BRICS, Families Watch, you know, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. And she is based in India. And, and for me, Laura Berka, who's a, a co-executive director in charge of programs at the Community Center for Integrated Development, CCID in Cameroon. I myself uh, will be playing the role as moderator and I'm as an associate professor at the School of Global Studies at Gotham University and I'm the president of CATH. So first I'm going, uh, the, the whole panel is going to be based on questions that I'm going to put to the different panelists here. So we can start with the discussion. It's not the presentation of everybody, but response to questions and discussion among the panelists. So the first question is, what were the aims of the Swedish Feminist Foreign Policy and what was its general impact? And then I will give the word to Antax. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for being here online and in real life. It's a pleasure to be invited. Um, I was asked by me to say just a couple of words of why I was asked to be here because I am I have a research group that looks at feminist foreign policy and its implementation in part by diplomats but I also lead a group that has spent a year now trying to look at the implementation of the feminist foreign policy by Swedish foreign policy actors so in other words how the goals that were set out in the policy how those goals were then what they were turned into when interpreted by foreign policy agencies and the 108 embassies that Sweden has around the the world. Um, the focus of our report is bilateral rather than multilateral diplomacy. So in other words, like the em em embassies work in different capitals in the world rather than say the United Nations or the European Union and that kind of stuff. And the report will be launched after the summer. So I'm not free to really disclose all the results yet. So I have to be sparse in terms of like what I share, but just so you know, you know, that that's why I was asked to be here. Um, so we were asked to think about what the aims of the Swedish feminist foreign policy were. For some of you, I think this will be familiar, but for others, it might be new. So as Edmia said, the policy was declared in 2014 by a social democratic government that called itself feminist more generally. So the sense was that this feminist disposition should also be, right, it should include foreign policy and not just the domestic policy areas. But the feminist foreign policy was also declared in response to developments internationally, right? That we were seeing this rise in anti-gender groups of resistance to, to women's rights and gender equality and LGBTQI plus rights, right? So in this co global context, a more organized and more vocal opposition to gender equality and women's rights, it was in that context also that the social democratic government kind of increased the ambition level and declared a feminist foreign policy. And so by and large, in terms of the aims, um, the feminist foreign policy was an extension of gender mainstreaming, which some of you might be, know what it is already, right? That the sense that gender and gender perspectives and attention to gender should be integrated in all activities, right? So the aim was to include this in the entirety of the Swedish foreign policy machinery. Um, it was seen as an approach. In other words, it was kind of a broad, right, like to think about and include attention to gender inequalities, to analyze gender inequalities, think about in what ways Swedish foreign policy could be put to work to address those gender inequalities. Um, it was articulated in terms eventually of the three R's that some of you might have heard of already, right, in terms of equal rights between men and women, boys and girls, equal representation, equal resources, right, and sometimes also a fourth R would be added, which had to do with like how to ground this in reality. Um, and in many ways, um, the feminist foreign policy was a continuation of existing Swedish gender equality work in foreign policy. I mean, Sweden had, especially in, in the arena of development aid and development cooperation, Sweden has worked with gender equality for a long time. So this wasn't new there. But in some other ways, the feminist foreign policy was groundbreaking and new, 
right? So it was a continuation, but also something very novel. I mean, one of the novelties, of course, was introducing this language. I mean, that's where they brought, what brought a lot of attention to the policy was that it was called feminist expressively, right? So that raised a lot of curiosity. What is this thing? What is it that's feminist about this policy and so forth? And to use that at the highest level of foreign policy. If you think about it in historical terms, that historically, I mean, even up, you know, Sweden really allowed women to serve as diplomats in 1948, right? So up until 1948, women were allowed in the foreign ministry. And now we have right, a foreign policy that's not just supposed to be attentive to gender equality, but that was also talked about in terms of feminism. Right? So it's quite a change in that sense. Um, but there were two other things I think that were new. Right? On the one hand, um, the feminist foreign policy was directed not just to development, but to all foreign policy areas. So that was novel. All the areas under the purview of the foreign ministry should bear in mind. Right? So um, the feminist foreign policy also involved, in other words, trade, which it hadn't before, and also foreign and security policy, which it hadn't before. So everything that went under the foreign ministry was supposed to be permeated with, by a gender approach. And it was also new in the sense that it incorporated the entire foreign service. right? The nine or 10 public agencies that are charged with implementing the feminist foreign policy and th these roughly 100 embassies and missions in the world, right? They're supposed to execute and implement and turn this into something concrete. They were all supposed to be working with feminist foreign policy for the first time. And the, briefly on impact, I mean, what we've looked at is impact, again, in terms of how these agencies and embassies, what they converted, the policy goals into. So we haven't looked at effects in other countries, right? That's not what this report was supposed to do. But in terms of impact and just broad strokes, I mean, we can say that there's a lot of autonomy built into the Swedish foreign policy system. So these embassies and agencies have a lot of room to interpret like what they want to do. And that was by design, right? So that's how Swedish foreign policy works. You set out some general guidelines and then the actors on the ground interpret and turn that, they turn that into feminist work on the ground. But given the, this, you know, it's a huge apparatus, people all around the world, varying levels of commitment to this policy, right? And various degrees, I mean, development having worked with this for much longer than say trade or security policy, it's not that surprising that implementation wasn't even, right? That we saw that like feminism became a lot of different kinds of things on the ground. There was no uniformity in what feminism was, was made to be. Um, there was variation in how much feminism was done in different parts of the world and by different actors, right? But again, that's part of how the policy was designed because there was leeway for each implementing actor to kind of decide what they wanted to do with it, right? So that's not in a sense surprising that we can show that in quite some detail in the report. So with that, I'll leave the word. Yes. And then now we will hear Ulrika. Yes, thank you. Um, Ulrika Grandin, I'm uh, currently the director of UN Women Sweden, uh, but I used to work in the Ministry for Foreign Affairs with the feminist foreign policy in the coordination team. Um, and uh, I was there not from the start in 2014, but I was there from about uh, 2016. Uh, and uh, the, the question is the aim and the impact. And I, I would say to, to complete what, what Anne was saying, of course, is that, um, that politically, I think it was to be very, very clear about the fact that gender and gender equality affects all areas of foreign policy and to really underline and make that clear and um, as you were also referring to to use the word feminist was a way to do that to really talk about it as being a more more of a transformative uh, approach and to really put that word together with foreign policy since that was new and that was kind of the the new um, and groundbreaking thing to really have that perspective in in uh, in everything uh, the foreign policy would do. 
uh, and as as I said, to lead the thoughts to something more transformative than just gender mainstreaming or gender integration. Um, uh, with that being said, I think you, you're right, Anne, that this would not probably be, have been done without uh, gender equality being very well integrated into a lot of national policy, but also to some of the foreign policy, especially development policy. But this was to put an edge to it and to broaden the agenda. And I think it was also, and uh, for Wallström and then the other ministers to follow, uh, based in a very firm belief in, in the more of the global peace agenda, the human peace agenda, that uh, gender is really a, a factor in, in the peace agenda and that women are uh, uh, essential for, for peace and also very affected by, by wars. And I think that was, but I'm guessing, but I think that was one of, of the, the basics for, for the minister. Uh, and then ultimately the, the aim was formed into this method that, that was used and uh, that I personally think was a really good method and goals and method with the three R's to really remember and really have that in, in kind of top of your mind uh, when you work with this policy. And this is of course rights, women's and girls' rights, the human rights agenda. And the second R is representation. Are women and girls represented in the room and, and what have you? And the third is resources. Are the resources fairly divided among uh, men and women? And uh, as I usually say, if you only work with those three R's, you have quite a lot to, to do. So I think it has been a really good uh, set of kind of aims, but also a method if you want. And also for the civil servants to, to really have that as a as a thing to remember when you work in in different contexts and um, uh, with different policies. Um, and then the impact, of course, I mean that's up to also research to 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 look at that eventually. But I think the impact from from where I uh, stand and was uh, standing is that. Uh, it really opened the eyes to to uh, fem a feminist approach being uh, available and uh, and um, uh, used as a method in foreign policy that you put those two together. I think that had a strong impact to really put those two agendas together. So I think it was new and, and inventive and eye opening. And um, I also think it normalized, if you can use that word, the, the, the feminist approach, uh, which we all know sometimes is a sensitive approach and it's supposed to be sensitive also and, and eye-opening, but it also normalized the, world, uh, the word because um, at least for the Swedish foreign feminist foreign policy, it was about women's and girls' human rights. Uh, it was not very much more complicated than that, but it is very complicated as we all know, but it, it, it didn't have to be more complicated than that. And I think that really worked well in an international context and in the multilateral context. Um, and I also think one of the big impacts was how it changed the, and that would be really interesting to study eventually the ministry internally because um, even if it was as as Anne said that maybe not all civil servants they they um, took this wholeheartedly, but um, at least as I know the civil servants are very very uh, obedient and do what their minister tells them. So they started working with this agenda, which in the end I think even the the ones being more skeptical changed their kind of vision because they had to and they had to put the gender glasses on if you want. So we really saw a big transformation uh, in the staff and in, in the civil servants. And also that the civil servants were, were in the beginning um, included in the forming of the policy. A letter was sent out to all embassies and all uh, units to ask them what, what would be your priorities if you were to work with the feminist foreign policy. So it made it kind of a, the ownership was, was um, large. And, uh, um, also, I think, uh, as I think you referred to, and also that 
since the embassies and, and the units have very free hands, so to say, to work with the policy, that also created the ownership. So I think one of the keys uh, was that the, the Swedish feminist foreign policy was at the same time very pragmatic, if you want. You, you could work with it as you wanted in the different contexts and policies, but at the same time, it was systematically done because it was in all the instructions and all the uh, letters to, to authorities or what have you. But of course, more importantly, is what, what it did externally. And, and uh, again, from where I was sitting and are, am sitting is that, and from what we've heard is that uh, women's rights defenders and women's rights organizations all over the world felt that it was a government acknowledging what they were doing and their work and, and, and put the light on their work and they were being seen, hopefully. And um, I think that has made a really big difference. And also uh, the policy was to invite uh, women's human rights activists and organizations to, to different meetings and different visits. And, and uh, in, for instance, when we worked in the Security Council, they were counseled, etc. I think that was a very, very big impact, I hope. And then, of course, um, uh, policies and programs, the Swedish ones were changed accordingly. So, I mean, they were more gender mainstream and gender integrated. And um, I think also uh, in in the end, uh, Sweden influenced other international actors, organizations and, and other countries in, in um, pursuing this policy. So I would say those things. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. And now uh, I'm going to ask uh, the rest of the panelists. They are going to intervene, of course, in the other questions. But if they have any reaction to these first um, presentations, pretty Mabel or inform me. You want to say anything here? Uh, Padme, I can wait to hear the uh, components and then respond. Okay, if that is okay. Yes, yes, oh, this is okay, of course. Yes, Mabel. You Sorry. Are... Uh, yes, I want to say that uh, for us uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, the example of the Swedish uh, feminist foreign policy was very, very important. And that's why we are now very preoccupied uh, due to the um, changes in these policies. Um, this is not only in the issue of the support to some groups or governments activities, but most due to the importance of in the international arena, where, as you know, for example, this year in CSW, we have had so many problems to approve language that for us used to be so well accepted and they want to review that. So this is why it's so important to have this uh, feminist foreign policy in, in most countries as we can, because it's a way to bring the ideas and the knowledge of what is gender perspective that is not only for women and their diversity, is for all human beings because feminists want equality and we want to have everybody the same rights and the same access to that. That's why it's so important. This is what I want to remark. Thanks. Thank you, Mabel. Yes, for me? Yes, thank you very much. Um, so um, just to add, so I'm really looking at the 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 the, the, the foreign policy and um, the whole discourse on intersectionality, the whole in, in um, how the, the the policy uses an intersectionality lens, um, a feminist lens, and a human rights um, approach, which is really beautiful and which has really set the pace or really make made activists um, and really made. Um, uh, uh, work to really like for us to really take a step behind to appreciate how um, intersectionality plays um, when it comes to gender equality or really um, addressing or actually meeting to the goal of gender equality. Um, 
to the sustainable development um goal five of course um, um to the the resolution 1325 and um the women peace and security agenda which is really really important because um some of these um things which have not really been discussed um in our in our context um this policy has actually made us to actually think that there is need for us to do more to think more so actually um not only just say okay we are going to use just um the feminist lens also think about how these things inter um, interconnect how um women's access to ri um, rights the, en the enjoyment of their rights um resources and um representation when it comes to um, poli um, politics, when it comes to peace, and how it's very important to put women at the center of this kind of decision where we must listen to women or must ask for what they want and listen to them and in turn act in what um act in, in issues like this. So I think um this has actually brought a lot of issues and a lot of um it's very important and it has set a very huge um space for discourse when it comes to the progress of gender equality. Thank you for me. And uh, now we go to question two, which is what has the feminist foreign policy as conceived in Sweden has had to do with development policies, foreign policy in general, conflict resolution issues? And I give the word back to Anne. Thank you. Um, before I get to that question, um, I want to just clarify maybe and respond to Lika to say that I don't think I made sufficiently clear maybe that the feminist foreign policy the implementation has led to more work across the Swedish Foreign Service. Okay, it's just that that's also been uneven. It led to a lot more work in some areas than others and in some in some embassies than others, right? But across the whole, it definitely did something that you know raised the attention to gender equality across the Foreign Service. Um, and then this point on intersectionality, I think is also incredibly important and something that it, it's not always stated in the Swedish foreign policy documents. It's there sometimes, right? But when you look at how Swedish embassies and Swedish agencies work in practice, they're, they are attentive, right? To diversity among women. They're, it's not as if they treat all women, you know, or women as a, a coherent unit, right? But the ways in which they work in intersectionality varies a lot. It's a difficult concept. It's difficult to, it's even difficult for academics to know how to do an intersectional analysis. It's not that easy for very busy civil servants to figure out what to do with this. But, but I think there is a tension to, for instance, poverty, right? That, that, and there's a tension to uh, sexual minorities. There is a tension to, um, human rights workers and they're, you know, in, in poverty and their kind of economic precarity and that sort of thing in practice, even though it doesn't always appear as such in the policy documents when there's a tendency to talk about women as a group or women and girls as a group, right? All right, so now to the question about the different policy areas. So in development policy, um, Swedish development policy has worked again with gender equality for a very long time. Um, and it continued after the launch of the feminist foreign policy, it largely continued working with gender equality language. So I would say that Swedish development policy, especially in CIDA, perhaps the Swedish International Development Agency, they did not switch over to language, feminist language. They continued with gender equality language by and large. And in our interviews, it was clear that not everybody in CIDA really knew whether they were affected by the feminist foreign policy, if they were included in that or not. There was some disagreement on that. So it's not as if everybody was aware or shared the idea that the Swedish development policy was included in the feminist foreign policy. Um, development policies, of course, have worked, and I think Ulrika can fill in much better here, right, that it has, you know, focused across the board on all kinds of issues, poverty issues, of course, democracy and human rights, sexual health and reproductive rights have been very important for Swedish development policy. And again, it's often been intersectional, trying to pay attention to variously situated groups and diversity within and among women and men. Um, even if SIDA and the development sector did not really switch to feminist language, they did increase their gender equality work after the launch of the feminist foreign policy, okay? So if we look at OECD DAC data before and after, uh, you know, they, they have these gender markers to see like how large of a share of foreign aid ha has paid any attention to gender. 
um, roughly, I mean, 75 to 80 percent of Swedish foreign aid had some gender component before the feminist foreign policy, but that increased by several percentage points after the launch of this feminist foreign policy. We don't know for sure that whether that was only about the feminist foreign policy, because you have to also bear in mind that there are multiple processes at work at once. There was gender mainstreaming integration in Swedish public agencies. That's another initiative that was parallel to this feminist foreign policy. And then there are all the international things going on, right? The women, women peace and security agenda, the sustainable development goals, right? There's a whole host of other things that also affect and, and influence Swedish foreign policy. Um, foreign policy in general, here I think would be get might be better. That's a hard one for a scholar to get access to. And we weren't, we didn't look at multilateralism. But again, like with the feminist foreign policy, all foreign policy was supposed to be permeated by a gender perspective, right? And I think if we look to trade policy, for instance, when Anne Linde took over after Margot Wallström, that was her sig signature, that she had a feminist trade policy, which meant a lot of soul search and a lot of thinking about what does that look like, right? I don't think most of us can think off the top of our heads, like what would a feminist trade policy look like? if you trade trade seriously but it involves a gender perspective right on thinking about the trade economy and thinking about women and men as business owners right but also as workers right? and also as consumers so different roles with vis-a-vis -vis trade and how women and men are distributed differently work in different sectors different salaries and they have different kinds of relationships to trade right? So doing analyses of that and then adjusting policies so that it works for gender equality in those things, which means, and whether that's transformative to get back to Ulrika's part about transformative depends on what you think you're transforming, right? The Swedish feminist foreign policies was committed to an open free market trade economy, right? So it's not a policy that's transformative of that sort of global market capitalism, right? As some people seem to have thought, it's making that capitalism kind of gender equal, right? So that's a different thing. So when we, it, when we think about transformative policy, it depends on what's supposed to transform, I think. And then finally, about coffee resolution, I think it also has better, more things to say than I do, but obviously Margot Wallström, she came, as Edmir said before, she came out of the UN as a special rapporteur on sexual violence and conflict. That was the thing that she was most passionate and knowledgeable about. So she focused quite a bit on this, right? On thinking about women's representation and particip participation and peace processes and negotiation. They started the Women's Mediation Network, right? To include women in peace negotiations and try to make sure that women's voices, women's organizations, civil society organizations representing women, that they would have a part in peace negotiations, right? So that was a really, really like important and prioritized part of Margot Wallström's kind of accomplishments, I think, as, as foreign minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, Ulrika? Yes, thank you. Um, on development policy, um, as we uh, said, I think that was one of the areas that was most developed when it came to or comes to gender uh, mainstreaming or having a gender perspective. Uh, and it, it was uh, even before the feminist foreign policy a, a focus area for Swedish development cooperation and an integrated area. Uh, but with the feminist foreign policy, uh, SIDA got a stronger um, uh, stronger wording in their instruction on working with gender equality issues. Uh, it also resulted in, uh, since SIDA is um, uh, steered by uh, strategies, it was a new um, global strategy for gender equality. And that hadn't been there before. There were global strategies on climate and on economic issues, but not on gender, because I think the, the thinking was that gender is integrated in everything. But this was a way to really focus on gender more, more um, clearly. And that strategy uh, did have a lot of focus on women's rights organization and supporting women's rights organization financially, which I think is a really strong point. Uh, and it also focused on the gender-based violence 
and um, statistics and data on gender equality. So I think it kind of filled some gaps that weren't there uh, that strongly before. And from, from what we heard also from um, CEDA staff and especially from the embassies was that uh, maybe the person working on gender equality in an embassy was usually a dev development person from CEDA. But with the feminist foreign policy, all of a sudden, uh, the, the ambassador, the political staff was also working on gender equality. And they could work together more strongly uh, when the focus was so much on gender equality. So it kind of coordinated and, and made the development side stronger because it had a political backing, if you want. So that's, I think, was a strong point. And on foreign policy, again, I would say that uh, it really was the, the internal uh, change of staff and civil services and the kind of structural approach to, to uh, gender equality, where the political leadership, of course, was very strong and very important. And I, the policy wouldn't have been there without that. But also the ownership of the staff and also uh, creating a kind of support system with uh, an ambassador, coordination team, focal points, uh, putting feminist um, issues and gender equality in the instructions and in the, the agendas of, of the ministry. Um, and also uh, embassies were, were to report on what they did on, on feminist foreign policy, which is important, of course. Uh, and also that Sweden was in the forefront on these issues in multilateral and in international context. That it was kind of clear from everyone that Sweden were going to say something about gender equality and we're going to push for that issue. And we were also the country with, that got a lot of questions on gender equality. And on uh, conflict resolution, uh, again, I think also the, the, of course, the women, peace and security agenda was lifted very much. Um, and one example, as I said before, was the, the time Sweden was uh, in the Security Council uh, and could uh, really try to influence uh, resolutions and, and uh, documents uh, taken at that time and also saw to it that women's rights um, organizations were, uh, were coming to the Security Council and um, giving them advice on different conflict situations. Uh, but I also think there were kind of new areas uh, like disarmament and more hardcore security issues where the gender um, equality issues had been a bit absent that was putting uh, uh, more light on those. Uh, and that's unsaid also a mediation network with the women mediation uh, mediators. Thank you. Thank you, Riga. Um, I think that we go now to the third question, which will bring also more the global South perspective. What makes a foreign policy feminist? What is the difference with any other foreign policy? And first, I'm go now I'm going to give the word to our uh, guests from different countries, different continents. First to Pretty. You are muted, Pretty. Uh, yeah. Apologies. So uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Edme, if you'll allow me, I would first like to uh, uh, share what the impact of feminist foreign policy is before I get into the third question, if that is okay, yes. uh, because I had not responded to the first and I uh, do want to thank you for having me on this panel. And Ulrike and Anne, it was a real pleasure to hear the whole Swedish process. It's one thing to read on paper, but uh, I really appreciated uh, the sharing of the process as well as the internal uh, impact and transformation that the feminist foreign policy has had in, um, in Sweden. And therefore, I do want to congratulate Sweden and all of you. I'm sure it must have been a really hard work to achieve this. 
And as a feminist, when I first heard the idea many years ago about a feminist foreign policy, I do have to admit I was totally seduced by this. And I was very interested that how gender can be integrated into a country's development activities. Uh, as Edme shared, I am a, uh, a founder as well as a global coordinator of BRICS Feminist Watch. And uh, uh, I, of course, today, I'm going to make my interventions from the point of view of being a, a global South feminist as well as a decolonial feminist, which I identify myself. And so uh, it is important for us to note that the greatest event of world history in the 20th century has been decolonialization. Although countries achieved independence from their past colonizers, the process of colonization continues to be an ongoing process. And this, of course, has opportunities as well as challenges. The discussion around foreign policy is very much located in this process, in particularly in Global South and maybe in other parts of it. So what I, uh, I feel, there are two components to this process. One is the actual process of uh, a country reaching uh, the decision having a, a feminist foreign policy within the country. And second is the content of this foreign policy. Now, what has been uh, the impact of foreign policy in my interventions? I'm not necessarily uh, drawing from particularly just Sweden, but this trend that we are seeing in the last few years with Sweden taking the first, uh, being the first country and how this trend of various countries, particularly in Europe and other parts of the world, have developed a foreign, foreign policy and what how has it impacted? Uh, say, uh, I would draw my observations from India particularly. Now in India, the foreign policy, feminist foreign policy is now being pushed uh, uh, by Europe as a good thing. In India, for example, uh, this particular uh, idea to develop a foreign policy is heavily funded by Europeans. Uh, Hold on one second, I just lost my notes. Hold on one second. My sorry. Uh, so it's heavily funded by uh, the Europeans and the related work we are seeing is, includes research, dialogue, events, roundtable, and also publications as knowledge pieces. So as a decolonial feminist, uh, this of course for us highlights a very colonial mindset. Even after territorial freedom, there continues still to be this kind of imposition of a universal narrative, a global linear thinking based on westernization that continues to unfortunately colonize our mind. This form of colonization is used to legitimize Western knowledge through artificial universalization. The work in India around feminist foreign policy is funded by Europe mainly and is quite strategically presented as a local initiative and concealing the Eurocentric origins. This also is artificially positioning a particular kind of reasoning knowledge, epistemology, and is therefore silencing local realities, context, and narratives. Now, why is this artificial universalization of feminist foreign policy in Indian context a problem? What these efforts are doing indirectly creating what is acceptable as a good gender equality indicator for a country, which is to have a feminist foreign policy. There is a homogenization process. That means that gender equality component in countries foreign policy should come under the banner of a feminist foreign policy. This also renders national components approaches to gender equality within a country's foreign policy as inadequate or invisible. As all countries have to strive to rise to the standard set by the West, it also reiterates West knows the best and that West do does it good for what West does is good for all. And so we all should be doing it. Now, in my this limited understanding, but as a feminist, there are a couple of questions which emerge that it is great. Like, I'm not taking away from countries that have developed feminist. I think it's a good thing. 
Uh, but there are a couple of questions which emerge in more recent uh, uh, global event context. The first thing is that uh, in 2020, when the world had the major uh, crisis given coronavirus, Sweden, as a member of European Union, voted against trip waivers and denied the vaccine accessibility for people, millions of people around the world, uh, and which could have saved life. And Sweden at that time stood with the pharma companies. And therefore, I would like to ask our Swedish uh, sisters that how do they see this role that Sweden played in global politics? How does it relate to, to me as a feminist, it seems like it's kind of a, a opposite to it. Uh, also, more recently, Sweden has expressed its interest to join NATO membership. Now, this feminist approach to foreign policy, like, again, I would think would be, and as Anna and Ulrich shared, would be human-centric and will focus on structures uh, that actually uh, are perpetuating inequality, injustice, and more promote inclusion and justice uh, approach. Also, as feminists, we are very skeptical whenever military solutions are sought in terms of security. We always want to prioritize human rights and civil society engagement. And so uh, these two incidences particularly, uh, uh, I would love to understand how they, uh, this has been looked at with Sweden having a feminist foreign policy within Sweden and in, with Sweden's position on these two very important global events. Thank you, Edmund. Thank you, Priti. Uh, would you want to answer right away? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go to the rest, yes. Uh, okay, hold on. So I really appreciate your comments and also some really, really both important questions that you raised and very profound. And, when I respond, I just want to make sure or clear that I don't, I'm not a representative of, of the Swedish feminist foreign policy, right? So when we study the implementation, we took the perspective of what the Swedish government sees as a feminist foreign policy to then trace, like, did the agencies actually implement that? Which is quite a different thing than like asking the sorts of questions that you're asking now, and then putting that critical lens to outsider lens, right? To the, to the Swedish feminist foreign policy. So I think I would leave like the defending of it, maybe <laughs> or explaining to Ulrika, but just to, um, since she was in the government, she was serving like under this, right? Or not in the government, but she was serving under the feminist foreign policy and didn't work as an academic trying to assess it. But um, let me just say that, it, again, without taking a side in this really, that the way that Sweden interpreted feminism, right, has not been that feminism is in conflict with militarism per se, right? So that's been quite clear. Both Anne Linde and Margot Wallström, both of them when we interviewed them have said that they don't see the feminist foreign policy as in conflict with Swedish arms production or Swedish arms trade, for instance. It's something that's, you know, they're trying to make Swedish arms production safe for women, so to speak, rather than saying that there's a conflict of interest here. So it's a very different, that's a particular way of understanding it, right? And I think also to the point is that the only agency that was not giving any instruction to integrate feminist foreign policy is the Inspector for Strategic Products, which is the agency that's in charge of, of regulating Swedish arms, arms trade. They were never instructed, right? That we couldn't see in any of their documentation any trace that they had been told to deal with feminist foreign policy, to integrate for feminist foreign policy, or they had done anything about this, right? So I think when we understand what the feminist foreign policy was made to be in practice and how it was interpreted, it's very much, you know, trade the way trade is, the international security system, the way the international security system is, and then trying to gender mainstream that, or the colonial hierarchies to some extent also, right, in the post-colonial hierarchies and trying to gender mainstream. And to some extent, I would say in practice, there's some attentiveness to colonial hierarchies in CIDA, in the embassies, and there's some attempt to, to contend with that, right? But they're also part of those structures. So I will leave it at that as a 
outsider academic <laughs> and turn this difficult question over to Ulrika to answer. Yeah, Ulrika. Oh. Well, just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not a politician and I was a civil servant for that government and now I represent the UN Women Sweden. But um, of course, I can try to, to say something on, I think you're right on, on those points, uh, Anne. Uh, it, it was putting a, family, a feminist lens and perspective to, to what was already there and, and didn't necessarily try to change arms industry or trade for that matter. But but what, what I think at least it's tried to do in a global context and the global South is it's tried to localize um, feminist foreign policy in the context and with the people there. And that why, that's why it was so important for the embassies to, they had instructions to always check with local women's rights organizations what were the local problems? Uh, how should we approach the local problems? I mean, that was the ambition in trying to, to localize the policy, right? And then if that succeeded all the time, uh, I, I couldn't say, and that that will probably um, see a little bit in her research, but, but that was the ambition to always be localized and to be context specific. And, um, but it was, uh, I think uh, we were talking about it before a little bit, the intersectional perspective of the policy was possibly a bit weak. I don't think that was uh, enough developed. I think it was, as Anne said, also uh, taken into account because if you take the context and the local context into account, you obviously have to be more intersectional, but it could have been clearer maybe. And in terms of, of weapons export, that was constantly the, the, the question asked to our ministers on how can Sweden export weapons uh, to other countries and at the same time have a feminist foreign policy. And for the politicians, this was not uh, something that was um, uh, opposite one another. Uh, that's at least how, how um, they explained it. But uh, so, there are always uh, conflicts of interest and conflicts of goals in the government, right? And, and I think that was definitely one. Thank you, Rika. Uh, do you want, uh, I would like to know if Mabel and for me want to say something? Okay, may I? Yes. Okay. Well, I want to say that in Latin America and the Caribbean, the process was different because as you know, uh, in the region, the feminist activists, we are strong and we are um, pushing many of our governments and, and, and also the, the society, the whole society, to the issues of the feminist or what we want to have on feminist uh, policies. So for us, uh, it's, it was not strange that the feminist uh, uh, foreign policy starts to be developed in countries where we, we have had some changes in the government promoted by women's groups or uh, after some uh, um, activities uh, and claiming against the government as happened in Chile and in Colombia. So we are now new governments that they have a different perspective in such a way and where the women feminists are much more um, strong and could be some possibilities. This is something I want to be clear because it was not produced by outside, is produced by inside in our in, in our countries, the change. Uh, saying that, I must say that we also consider important to have these policies developed not only by governments. We promote that they are developed by governments with the participation of civil society groups and specifically of feminists. And this is very important because um, they are not going to be only the governments. We need to have 
the uh, all the groups involved in feminist activities in the government and outside the government in the society been involved in that. This is what happened or tried to happen in uh, Chile and in Colombia more than Mexico, where is more um, a, a, a governmental policy. In Argentina, now we have, since the beginning of the year, an area in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that is dedicated to uh, gender equality and promoting this in all the government. We are not yet defined clearly our feminist policy, mm, policy, but we are in the way to. And we, the unit in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is working with a coalition of us, the NGOs, the feminist NGOs that we are working. Uh, we have a commission or a committee for gender equality in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And now we can, uh, we have these activities and we are sharing uh, ideas. So we are developing that. And I want to say about this, that since uh, 2019, we have a group that now is a global partner network for, police, for feminist foreign policy that there is a coalition of governments and in, uh, feminist activists from the world in different countries promoting uh, the uh, feminist foreign policy. And this network, we are working and in 2021, we have had a meeting uh, in which we define feminist foreign policy in a way that the people can understand what it means because we want to be sure they are going to be a coherent uh, policies of internal policies with external policies. And of course, as Priti says, still there are many conflicts in which they are not in the same line. For example, the decisions about the armament. This is not easy because it seems to be is different and they are not looking at the issue of connections. So this is something we need to develop and we need to increase. And this is not going to be from one day to another. And the big problem is that there are some economical issues that they are very important. And now with the uh, war in uh, Ukraine, it's a terrible against because all governments increase their interest in the armament. So we are complaining for that, but this is something that we are not able to change because of course, the attitudes of those acting in both sides, uh, in the Russian and in the Ukrainian, that they are not only one government or another, but they are a coalition there also, are very different. So we need to continue fighting and continue letting them know that this is not what the feminist foreign policy wants. We want to change the investment of armaments and to be growing the investment of development. And this is something that needs to be doing in a way in which, of course, we consider the increase in the access to funding for feminist NGOs, but also for governments, because this needs to involve the government. But it's very difficult, and we need to fight against that. And this is something that we are very preoccupied, how we manage this how we are going to do and how we can do in a better way, because it's very difficult. The another point that Priti says about the uh, difference in how was it the commercial issue of the vaccines, this is more than one country. And this is the problem that for the first time with COVID or coronavirus, as you want to call, vaccines became and uh, a business 
always vaccines, vaccines are used to be not a business. No one considered that Sol will be uh, selling the vaccines. He developed the vaccine and he offered to everybody and this was not. So this is a change in the world that we need to fight against. So the problem is uh, how we are working. It's not one country, I say, is global and how we approach the inequalities in the health services and in the production of farmers. We have been working long time on HIV and the antiretrovirals and how this was also an economic issue in which we have the life of many people in, in poor countries that couldn't reach because they couldn't have access to cheap uh, uh, treatment that they were effective, but they were not done by the big farmers. So we need to continue fighting, but this is not individual. This is a, a more uh, broad. And this is why it's so important that if our governments have feminist foreign policies, they are obliged, or at least we, the civil society and the population, we need to request a coherence among internal and external. So this is something in which we need to also involve not only the feminists and the women, but we need to involve all the society because this needs to be controlled. This needs to be, but this needs to be something that was assumed by everybody. I think um, we are in a way in Latin America to do things. But as you know, the different political ideas are growing. And now, for example, in Chile, we have had a last election in which the right wing again was growing. And this is very, very preoccupied. So we need to find a way to work also with the political parties in order to find and to understand that this is something that we need to uh, have clear ideas. This couldn't be on the feminist hands. It must be from all the society and the government. So this is something we are doing, we are working, it's not easy. And this Global Partner Network for uh, Feminist um, uh, Foreign Policy, we are working and trying to mobilize worldwide these ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. I just give uh, briefly the word to Mop for me and then afterwards to Pretty because uh, it's very late in as well. For me, please. Yes, thank you very much. So um, the whole idea of, of the feminist uh, foreign policy in um, the African context or the, Af the Cameroonian context has not really been welcomed. Um, I think um, mainly because there is the misconception of the word feminism. So, um, and Cameroon is one of those countries when it comes to the presentation of women in politics, um, we've never had a female governor. We've never had a female, uh, minister, female ministers in strategic um, ministries like justice, like finance, and all the like the, the big uh, ministries. We've never had a female president. So um, this, all of these issues of um, feminism or the feminist policy is something which um, it's 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 um, it's it, it has brought fear among um, those um, holding. Um, um, power in the, in our community, and there is a huge um, need to deconstruct um, the word feminism so it's welcomed and it's understood um, by all. And I think that um, this um, this policy has actually um, brought um, women rights organization, women led organization, or feminist led organization to really think of how they can work collaboratively with um, each and every uh, member of the society um, in addressing issues when it comes to women's um, resources, uh, women's rights, and women's representation. Um, given that um, Cameroon is torn apart by three uh, the triple by a triple crisis, which is uh, basically the Anglophone crisis, um, the Boko Haram crisis and the Central African Republic crisis, which is um, puts us in a really, really um, a, a bad situation. In a, like we are in really in a humanitarian context and all of these things um, 
come into play and the need um, to really work collaboratively to see um, how we can address issues of discrimination or to seek um, gender justice and social justice um, in, in, the, in the communities we, we, we work in. And um, particularly, I think um, the feminist policy is not um, something that um, Cameroonians, we Cameroonians, or in a setting, we are actually thinking of, um, um, there's actually a, disc a discourse around that of developing such a policy, but it has actually brought um, a certain momentum among women-led organizations because we have, uh, what it has actually brought, uh, made, given courage to women-led organizations to have coalitions. We have um, networks um, like the, the Southwest Women um, um, Peace Task Force, which is um, made up of women who feel uh, who, who actually acknowledge that women or feel that it's it um, women should be at the forefront of peace processes. And I think this one of the things that have actually encouraged um, these women um, or these women-led organizations is um, the feminist policy and like which has really pushed the agenda. And for women to really think about um, how issues really interconnect, because um, despite the fact that um, the feminist policy has not really um, discuss the whole issue of intersectionality but um we women led organizations are thinking um is the issue of intersectionality a global something or do we have um, um Cameroonians have um different ways in which this intersectionality plays or this discrimination place or how uh, resources are distributed in the in, in our in our communities given the fact that we still live in a community where women have no access to um to, to land to property women um barely have access to um, um keeping your name after marriage and all of these things so you look look at all of these things and you see we are still um behind when it comes to um to 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 to, to addressing all of these issues concerning women and there is a need to actually um, you have to appreciate um, the feminist policy and see how um, we can work collaboratively with um, not just as women-led organizations, not, not just as um, non-governmental organizations, but also with government officials to see or to own um, discussions like this or own um, processes like this to transform, um, to, to bring about gender transformative um, approaches to see how um, they can address the need of women and see uh, and seek um, gender equality um, in the communities we live in and also the issue of accountability and like by holding each and every member accountable um, in the community um, be it um, the community members be it um, the ministries who work in being the women-led organization, which is extremely important um, in in at, 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 um, attaining this um, or actually addressing issues of gender equality um, in, in in our society. Thank you for me. So, Preeti, please. Uh, thank you, Edme, and thank you, and, and uh, Ulrike, for responding to my uh, questions earlier. So, of course, as I shared, India doesn't have a feminist foreign policy. And so far, the discussions or events, activities around feminist policy in India, what I'm seeing, are very much imposed by Europe through funding or through other means. So what does India have? India last year in 2022 uh, has set a national goal that India in the year 2047, that is in 25 years, India would be totally decolonized. 2047 would be 100 years of India's independence. Now this goal, this national goal kind of is, we are seeing how it is permeating through all our national policy thinking activity. India also this year has the G20 presidency and India's maxim for G20 is Vasudev Kutumbakam, which literally means the whole world is one family. It further refers to India's advocacy within the G20. The tagline India has given is one earth, one family, one future. This particular has mentions into our ancient text and ancient knowledge. And it's also this particular Vasudev Kutumbakam is very much part of our uh, collective consciousness of this region or this land. And it's engraved on the entry of the, our parliament also. Additionally, it is important to also question this whole concept of foreign, as in foreign policy, which relates to the, how does it relate to the notion of one world family, which believes that there is nothing foreign. The whole world is one family. 
the collective consciousness of India and the land here, here believes that the whole universe, as we call Bra Brahman, is within us, with, is within each one of us, and is the same universal energy consciousness that exists, what exists in me, exists in you, in others, in every single person, and in every single thing, and that is the only truth. What we see the world outside is just an illusion or what we call as Maya. So it is the same consciousness that exists in each one of us and that is the universal truth. Hence, we are all one and we belong to one collective consciousness and hence there is nothing foreign or nothing other. It is important to understand this and to see how India, whether India is really holding true to this particular uh, slogan, maxim, or goal that India has said, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, one earth, one family, one future. So during COVID crisis, India was the pharmacy of the world. India not only vaccinated 1.4 billion population of its own, but provided vaccine and critical drugs free of cost to 150 countries. India did this with the whole idea of one world, one family, one future. Similarly, within COP26 in Glasgow, India had a concept called life, which is lifestyle for environment, which was introduced by our prime minister uh, and which has led to an international mass movement towards mindful, deliberate utilization instead of mindless and destructive con consumption in order to protect and preserve the environment. Now, life puts individual and collective duty on everyone to live a life, uh, to live a life that is in tune with earth and does not harm the environment. The concept of life is drawn again from our ancient treks and also resonates with several indigenous practices globally. These are some great examples of India's decolonial approach at the highest policy level forum and how uh, India is approaching is foreign policy. Now within G20 in India, one of the key themes India has declared is women-led development. Now women-led development is not a theme for Women 20 or a gender working group, but women-led development is an overarching theme for G20 uh, this year under India's presidency. This is a very big transformation and a very big step by India. And India is, of course, obviously trying to change the narrative in that direction. There are many discussions happening around this as part of G20 process. And I've been part of some of it. And I want to share what are the building blocks emerging from this framework. And developing this framework is a process we all have been waiting to see. It will be something we'll have to wait and see how various communiques within G20 from different engagement groups provide their recommendations and frameworks around women-led development and also how the final declaration from G20 this year incorporates the uh, women-led development and what will be some of the building blocks. But what my hope as a feminist is that the momentum is not just around G20, but this momentum to build this framework around women-led development continues beyond G20 and beyond this year. So what are we looking at so far from the conversation discussion around women-led development in this context? So women-led development, of course, as it, the, uh, it suggests, it goes beyond looking at women as mere beneficiary. So women are not seen just seen as passive receivers of development or welfare policy. Uh, policy. It recognizes women as active economic agents or stakeholder with knowledge and skills. Hence, women need to be part of all decision-making processes as part of identifying development priorities, designing interventions, and implementing monitoring everything. Women should also be part of all development agents as with equality and in a just manner. The second component of this is economically empowering women, which is creating opportunities as well as right conditions for women's full employment as well as entrepreneurship 
and uh, uh, as uh, having access ownership management rights to productive resources. So first of all, it's important to look at obstacles uh, that, which prevent women from their economic empowerment. Of course, the whole unpaid work, especially unpaid care work, childcare, healthcare, elderly care, is a burden which limits women's participation in labor market. Second, particularly women in the South have an additional time burden of securing clean water, fuel, fodder. And so women-led development needs to provide for adequate infrastructure, both care as well as for uh, essential basic rights and essential services. So financing for social infrastructure should be a priority, is an important recommendation within women-led development. Now, women unpaid work is also seen within subsistence form of livelihoods which is whether it's production and many work around uh, 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 family farms or household, et cetera. It's important to therefore recognize that 50% of agriculture workers globally are women. Therefore, agriculture policy globally need to recognize women as farmers, even if they don't, they are not landowners. Women's financial inclusion, women's access to productive resources, including energy, technology, knowledge, information, women's skill development are all part of these building blocks which are talking about women-led development, including digital literacy and how we reduce the digital gender divide. Now, as Ulrike shared, for us, this conversation around women-led development, of course, the G20 presidency has provided us the opportunity, but what as a feminist or as a, a woman leader based in India, what I'm seeing is, is very transformative and is in holds a lot of promise. It has brought different stakeholders to different uh, uh, panels, discussion, debates, sharing, learning, right from the ground to highest level of policy maker. And that's why I would say this is for us in India, it's a tr transformative step because India has put this at a very high level within G20. It also has the three R's that Ulrike shared. It does talk about rights, it does talk about representation, and it does talk about resources. Oh, I would stop here, thanks so much. Um, thank you, Priti. And uh, as a matter of fact, I would like to 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 put a question to you, Priti, because as you as you presented what is happening in India, I was just um, reflecting on the fact that the government in India is a government which is considered to be quite far to the right and very kind of authoritarian as well and very oppressive to minorities or to Muslim people. And uh, not because I said, because I have read especially uh, in, in, in recent reports. So I, I don't see how this government is putting the fact that uh, women should be uh, put in a position of uh, transforming society. So I would like to, to know more about your reflections on this. Mm -hmm. uh, you've asked me the most difficult question and I don't want to come across. Um, I think, uh, admit there are a couple of things to it. Uh, there, one is everything that the Western media says is not true. Uh, at the same time, I would not deny that there aren't incidences of, uh, you know, certain uh, uh, curtailment or certain restriction limitations that are happening in uh, India. Uh, uh, so, yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes people ask that, okay, you are a human right person. Is it absolutely, or you are a feminist, is it absolutely impossible to work in India? The current government, like the, how the trend is globally, is uh, what I would say uh, 
a conservative traditional whether we call it like india in a, its decolonial thinking rejects this right and left uh framework because they they look at it as a very western uh construct and they look call it like conservative traditionalist approach which of course the current government has i don't know what is the uh Uh, source of right wing or left wing uh, but uh, there are many debates conversation around that uh, 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 now uh, is it a difficult uh, space is it a restricted space uh, so what i'm seeing is that a particular ideology or a particular uh, uh, kind of uh, civil society have been given restricted um, you would say space or engagement in many of these uh, um, participation or which many of uh, us as human rights or had uh, previously however we cannot say that civil society in india is totally curtailed because there is a, a very much a increased participation of uh civil societies uh from uh, 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 which were very from a very different ideology and mindset uh so take for example uh, there are uh, groups like with uh, which are large spiritual organization which have over 450 million volunteers globally and exist in over 150 countries uh, which i'm sure in international discourse uh, many of you have never even heard of them they are the ones who even within g20 have very prominent role and prominent space and leadership and yes they are civil society they are ngos they come with that and so people say okay indian government is giving space to those ngos who will not criticize them and only those who uh, talk like them and that is why they have been picked and all uh it's it's also like again for me as a as a feminist that i identify as a feminist from global south and i do identify i do want to understand what this decolonialism means i'm also a western trained feminist so my concept of empowerment of equality is very much influenced by what i have learned all these years from a very western articulation and if you ask me i have no way language framework how to articulate an alternative perspective of empowerment entitlement etc now india is very strategically very deliberately giving space to some of these uh analysis voices organizations in these global platform in a way to very deliberately decolonize its approach so uh and everything which has a western funding western influence is looked at critically in this ecosystem in that way okay yeah does that answer your question yes it's difficult it's challenging and yes. we are all going through it Yes. Yes. Okay, uh does um, Mabel or uh, for me want to add anything around this and we were in uh, uh, pretty has already answered that regarding how has the idea of a feminist foreign policy developed in other parts of the world? Uh pretty has given us an, an image of that. Do you want to say something more uh Mabel or uh, for me? Uh, I cannot what a uh, pretty said, and I'm going to be more uh, for uh, more broad maybe because I want to say that also 
we need to fight for these uh, feminist foreign policies to advise um, the um, G20 and the G7 about this. Because as you know, those are um, the countries where they are doing most of the um, processes for the global issue. Um, I've been working in the G20 as in the Women 20, that is the, the NGO's uh, activities related to G20 in Argentina. And we continue since 2018 that we have the G20 here. And now since last year, I'm also an advisor in the, G in the Women 7. Uh, first for Germany last year and this year for Japan. And um, last year uh, we were developed um, in the group of the uh, uh, G the Women Seven, a special chapter for the um, feminist foreign policies, in which women from the north and the south we put together what must be the policy that we request the G7 countries to adopt and, to, and we push them to adopt them. And the best example is Germany that they create the German uh, feminist foreign policy, but not only in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also in the Ministry of Development. Why? Because in the development, there are the issues where they are taking care of all the collaboration for development inside the country and outside the country. So I think this is a good example how they try to make not only statements about the, the for, uh, feminist uh, foreign policy, but also support countries and and uh, civil society, feminist civil society, to develop and to work on that. I think this is a very good idea in which we are going to be able to build uh, some good examples of good practices. But it's very, uh, it's going to take long times, I'm afraid. And as I, as I said before, for example, we, we promote multilateral uh, policies and we promote uh, anti-colonialism and we promote um, uh, 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 less uh, funding for armaments. But all this needs to be worked uh, very hard because there are so many uh, activities pushing back and specifically all related to the economic side that we need to uh, know they are not easy to fight, but we need to do work, not only with the foreign, foreign affairs uh, ministries, but also with the economic development and other ministries. This is something that we need to consider in order to be able to do a feminist foreign policy that consider all the aspects. So this is the challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. And for me, do you want to add something? Um, no, no, no. No, not to this. <laughs> so <laughs> perhaps we round up what we have said, and I give back the word to Anne and to Ulrika. Okay, where are we? <laughs> we are at the end. <laughs> at the end of what makes a foreign policy feminist foreign policy yes. feminist? Yes. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, I think that question is really hard to answer because it depends on obviously what you mean by the term feminism. And feminism is, you know, it's one of those kind of in academic language, empty signifiers, right? It can be filled with any meaning. So feminism can be a range of things. It's not one thing. And we know this from feminist activism and feminist theory that there are all kinds of different feminisms, right, in the world. And so 
foreign policy can be feminist in a lot of different ways. And I think the Swedish feminist for foreign policy was feminist in the sense that, you know, like I described before, largely taking a free trade global market economy as a given, largely taking a militarized security order as given. And within that, seeing like, how can we attend to the rights, representation and resources of women, right? And in one sense, I think, obviously, if we envision a world where those things, you know, the, the trade and markets are remain the same, the militarized security situation remains the same, but imagine if resources were equally distributed between men and women, it is quite different. That would not be the same kind of market economy. So even for those that consider themselves to be liberal feminists, right, that like, into that sort of system, it's still a remarkable change. And it's still a vision, a vision to have, even though it's not the same feminism, right, that lots of other people would like to see. So, you know, to ask the question, what makes a foreign policy feminist? I mean, it just hinges on what we mean by feminism. And I think that's just the perennial issue for academics and activists alike, right, that we load that term with so much different meaning, and we have different ideas and visions about what that is. And the trick, I think, and I think that comes out clearly here from people speaking from di different positionalities in different parts of the world is coming up with ways, bridges, right, to find perhaps coalition building between people that have different visions of what feminism is and should be to that way kind of move forward in some way. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Ulrika. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have that much to add to that, but I mean, uh, of course, the obvious and easy answer is that uh, a feminist foreign policy is a foreign policy with your gender glasses on, if you want, and to keep in mind the the the, the three R's. And um, as Anne said, if you have a, think about distributing resources more equally being more represented and um, uh, having their rights, a lot, a lot of things would probably change and it. It would be transformative. But I wanted maybe to add on to what Mabel said on, on other ministries having to have a feminist approach. And uh, again, I think the, the Swedish feminist foreign policy and that it was possible was largely due to uh, these issues being uh, worked on in Sweden for since the, I mean, long time, but since the 70s with the, the large reforms being done on women being much more on the labor market, with having free child care, uh, with having social protection systems that works for more equally, uh, and to have women more represented in, in parliament and in the government that has made a big difference for, for gender equality issues in Sweden. And, and that has made it possible for, for Sweden to also be a feminist actor abroad. So, so it is important to, to look at it more holistically maybe and, and in all areas, not just the, the foreign, the foreign the, as you said, so uh, good, pretty with foreign, what is a foreign policy? Anyways, it's a, a strange word when you think of it. Um, but so I think that just uh, thinking of it more holistically and also in, in a national uh, context. Uh, thank you, Rika. Do you want, uh, I will give you the word back, Pretty. Do you want to, to say something? Right? What makes uh, a feminist foreign policy feminist? Um, I think we have talked about and there are many good building blocks or uh, many things which have been shared by all the uh, panelists. Uh, but I think um, each country has its own uh, uh, context, reality, cultural, uh, uh, and where that country is. And so it is really important if we really want uh, feminist foreign policy to emerge from different countries to allow these national processes to uh, emerge organically. As Ulrike shared, that from 1970, it took the country 30, 40 years 
and when they had all these right components that after 30 40 years they were able to very naturally perhaps arrive at what would be a feminist foreign policy but something which get imposed from outside like india today can reject outside interventions but there are many other countries in the world which will totally crumble and under such kind of out outside interventions and so these interventions need to be greatly criticized and really this doesn't help in our uh, work collectively towards having a feminist foreign policy in different countries and as uh, mabel also shared that how we develop this global culture around uh, all the policies have a feminist lens to it so it is really important because uh, uh you know uh, uh that there is this kind of sensitivity and there is this kind of awareness that let each country go through its own process and when it is ready it will move in that direction and it will have uh what it will define as what its uh what the component and what the foreign policy should be and so as as i shared what india is doing and it might be seen by several others that oh we are only doing in the, within the development framework well that is a starting place for us like you know that's where we are and that's a starting place and that's a good thing it's okay uh, uh because there is a national process uh, which is inclusive which is creating the space to have all these conversations which is let's see where it goes and how far we go and then um, let it emerge on its own thank you priti uh, for me um yes thank you very much um i don't really have much to say but um i think what makes um a foreign um, policy feminist um it's really like i really look at the the beauty in feminism right where um um there are whole so many types of feminists and of course we all have um common grounds so um what makes a policy feminist for me or a foreign a policy feminist for me is um the fact that it actually takes in takes at how we actually it's really intentional about recognizing and seeking to address all the barriers women uh, face uh, when it comes to address uh, to the enjoyment of human rights um uh, and really looking taking into account or really reflect at it we are when it comes to the resources the, the distribution of resources when it comes to presentation and when it comes to human rights and making sure of um really being intentional about making women at the forefront of um these discussions or the forefront of these processes so to me it 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 it, it depends on the context um because um context matters too right when it comes to cult cultural context religious context geographical and so on and so forth but it's um but again it's just about putting um making sure that um these women um are the forefront of all of these things or, and they are really put um, or they are really really at hand um when it comes to um the development of these um policies thank you very much uh, for me mabel says that she's coming back she was she's a little bit she absent for some minutes and uh, i just wanted to ask the audience here the public or the public that is also online if you have any questions or any comments before we finish this uh, very interesting discussion yes we have to yes uh, i would like to ask uh, uh, during the uh, csw the uh, uh, un can, can you hear me yeah. so so they hear you as well Uh, I I followed the uh, CSW conference in um, New York in uh, March and uh, there was a, a seminar there uh, by the femin uh, uh, about the feminist foreign policy from the International Center for Research on Women mm. and there they made they made a list of the criteria for uh, a policy to be called feminist mm. and I wondered Uh, how well known is that are they that how established are they is it something that would influence the discussion globally mm -hmm. thank you yeah. mm -hmm. i haven't seen that particular list but there's definitely i think a, a kind of 
establishing of some sort of repertoire of what it should, what a feminist foreign policy should look like, right? I think there are a lot of places that are talking in terms of the three R's, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So, but also I think each country's, you know, the countries that have declared feminist foreign policies, they do put their own twist on it. And it's, it's not a carbon copy of the Swedish feminist foreign policy. But there's also learning. I know it's a little bit vague, but like there, some things are shared and some things change as it moves around the world. And I don't know about the specific list. Maybe it becomes something that circulates. I don't know. It's really, really, I think they really try to find what uh, uh, it, all the countries would have in common. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, your your question. Yes, uh, I just want to say thank you so much. It's a fantastic uh, panel uh, that you organized. I have two questions, and uh, they are for different people. So the question one is for two people, and you decide how you want to answer. It's to Anne and to Ulrika, and uh, the second question will be to uh, Pretty. And it's uh, both questions are about how much can we compromise on our morale, and I want you to answer humans now not as swedes not as indians or other nationalities as humans so the first how can we have feminism if people in bangladesh are suing our clothes that we can buy it's cheap here so it's about feminist foreign policy and for uh, pretty how can we decolonize if we can have a caste system where women of one caste clean house of other women's caste so in this kind of sense how can we preach morale if we cannot deal with basic inequalities that we are uh, facing, things. Uh, first, Ulrika and... Okay. Um, <laughs> you guys ask really good and really difficult questions. Um, that's a very hard question to answer, I think, because it depends on, you know, what do we compare with, right? It's one thing if we see feminist foreign policy as preaching morality and preaching that Sweden somehow has attained all these things and is like the perfect role model. But I, I'm not sure that there are many people in Sweden that really, I mean, you hear that sometimes, right, from certain ambassadors or certain, you know, when there's public diplomacy events. But in general, I'm not sure that most, you know, proponents of the Swedish feminist foreign policy think that everything is so wonderful or completely unaware of horrible inequalities in the world and Swedish participation in those, right? But I, I'll let that say. But then the question is like, what do we do with that? Is it, if it can't be ideal, if we can't, you know, do we just then step back and say, okay, let's just continue with foreign policy that was the way it was before? Would that be better? Like removing morality out of foreign policy and just going on with kind of real politique as if, right? Or do you do what you can pragmatically, right? Maybe arms trade wasn't possible. I'm not one to judge that because I wasn't in civil service or in the government, but it's possible that that was kind of a limit like to what these, you know, the people that wanted to have a feminist foreign policy, what they could do. Right? We have to think about what would have happened if they had insisted on that. Maybe the whole thing would have gone out the door earlier, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, to me, it seems like some sort of balancing, that's my, that's my personal view. You know, you do what you can, given the structural conditions that you exist in. I don't think that there is really a, you know, a, a perfect moral position to speak from or to act upon, right? And that means you, yes, you do get, it, it's, it is messy and there will be hypocrisy and it is not, it's contradictory. And, you know, it is an unequal world that Sweden benefits from, not all Swedes, right? But Sweden does, you know, at least like most of the elites that run foreign policy benefit from an unequal world. I mean, um, but then what do you do with that, right? Throw up your hands and say, okay, let's just play dirty or do you try to do something? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Anne. Uh, Ulrika, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think Anne expressed that very well, thank you. Then, Priti, did you hear the question, Priti? It may, I didn't fully understand, if you don't mind repeating, just so that I understand uh, yeah. what was... So there was something I, on... Perhaps so you can I, come. No, can I come? Should I come? Yeah, I think it's better. Of course. Here, here. Can you see me now also? Hi. <laughs> 
So the question is, I'm trying to ask critical questions to people who present different positionality just to show that there is no perfect solution. So to Anne and to Ulrika asked, how can we have a ministry from policy or preach morale when we buy our clothes basically from people who sue it in Bangladesh? And to you, the question is, how can we preach decolonization when we have authoritarian governments? Or how can we preach decolonization when we have caste system, when some women have uh, maids in their houses of different castes that cannot even share the same space. So this is a question that I'm asking. Can there be a decolonization under these conditions? Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, can you can you repeat caste system when we have, can you just say I, for a minute? Yes. Not... So you, you talked about decolonization in India, right? And then uh, Adme, right, is your name. Adme asked you about authoritarianism and how can you decolonize? a place when you're not perfect yourself. And I'm adding another layer of when women exploiting other women of different castes. So how can we have decolonization in these conditions as well? Okay, uh, so thank you so much for the question. So let me first really put it out, just because we are going through a process of decolonialization doesn't mean we are trying to achieve perfection. Uh, we do recognize all the social uh, uh, issues, problems that we have in our country, uh, whether they are historically, culturally, or as they are coming forward, uh, and new issues, new uh, this thing. So just to say as feminist and as decolonial feminists, I don't, uh, uh, it would be wrong for me to say that, okay, when India will so-called claim decolonialism, there won't be any violence against women, right? Like, you know, uh, it's not Ethiopia we are talking about. Let's be realistic. Uh, but uh, given where India is, where India wants to go, India has set a particular goal and process uh, in place. Uh, uh, now, uh, yes, there are caste discrimination and there are a lot of efforts, initiatives, uh, affirmative actions which are made, how to uh, ensure that everyone has, as we talk about in terms of equal opportunities, both of um, you know access as well as in terms of outcome uh, for everyone. But does that, uh, is it happening uh, across? There are some promising development for sure but there are also gaps which we all continuously need to monitor and be um, uh, mind, mindful of. Um, and so uh, 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 regarding authoritarianism, uh, I don't know. I know like, you know, uh, some of it gets in this Western media gets over uh, uh, this thing. Like, I don't know if you know, India recently had a state election in the Southern state of India and the ruling party BJP lost heavily, heavily, heavily. It was over, it was totally thrown. So I just want to say that whatever is the perception that uh, people have of India, we have a functioning democracy and we de do throw governments out. And so in the uh, tenure that this current government is and whatever practice or whatever, if it is not delivering what people want, the next election, there is a danger they will be thrown out to a democratic process. India is a functioning democracy and our democratic process institutions do work. Very good. Thank you, Pretty. Uh, any more questions? Or from uh, people listening online, if you have any questions, you can also put them in the chat or something. Uh, I don't see it. Yes, obviously. Uh, Linda says, maybe we need to see feminist foreign policy as a process, something to aspire to, but as yet unfinished. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
or anybody else who wants to comment or raise a question? Yes. Raise your voice. I have, a, I, I have two questions. Yes. I have many questions, but I will narrow down and I'll just ask you. <laughs> um, so the first one is to uh, Priti. And I would like to ask about all these fundings that are coming from the European Union uh, to financiate this uh, feminist foreign policy. Um, what is your, I mean, you already gave us a great interpretation of the power relations that there are behind uh, such a financial transfer and investment and the kind of soft power that there is behind soft and not or just soft. Um, but I, I wanted to ask you if like you have any other reason for why now European Union may and Western countries may be so interested in uh, pursuing this uh, feminist foreign policy um, discourses uh, in India, like if there are maybe, I don't know, um, don't want to raise any, um, I don't know, like uh, any hypothesis of, up on the hair, but like just uh, if there are maybe economic reasons behind, or like if uh, there is the, uh, I mean, uh, of course, there are always economic reasons when it is about uh, neo colonial uh, practices, but yeah. Did you hear the question, Priti? Um, you are muted. Um, yeah, uh, thanks so much, Edmund. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, so the funding, I don't know if necessarily it's from European Union, but it's definitely from European country. German particularly is very heavily funding. Uh, they are not necessarily funding, like, you know, uh, um, these uh, local conversations, but they are planting uh, people, organizations who they think are uh, uh, to conduct these conversations and discussions. And so it's totally imposed and it's horrendous. It's horrendous. If you look at any of their reports and discussion, it is so bad. It is so bad. Uh, and in a country like India, uh, uh, they are doing this. And like, you know, I have no answer. Uh, you should probably go and ask why Germans and uh, I think UK is funding. There are think tanks being funded and they are uh, this thing. I can just give you my honest this thing that it's horrendous. It is not located in Indian consciousness, Indian reality, Indian, uh, you know, where uh, our thinking is. And it is this interest to have a feminist policy has not come from, as Mabel said, uh, shared, it has not come from women's movement or the feminist uh, movement leaders in India. It is an outside imposition and it is artificially being created. Uh, so as a feminist, I'm not against having gender integrated in diplomatic activity. I think it's a good thing. But this process has to be either from the national movements, from the women leaders, participation, thinking. It has to be located in our context, not to take a blueprint of what Europe has done and then to say, and it also has a very anti-Indian narrative. That see, India is so bad. It has not done this. It is not doing that. India is treating. It's the same thing. The kind of questions you all asked about India is the image that the world uh, holds for India. It's all these bad things are happening in India. And so it won't it be good to have a foreign policy or feminist forum so that women of India can have a better so-called rights and this and that. Well, women of India are very much capable of working towards and, uh, you know, and whatever you're hearing, whatever is the interest of this kind of propaganda, you might want to think about that what is perpetuating all this and why Europe is funding this kind of work in India. And if they're doing it in India, I'm pretty sure they're doing it in other countries. And if you want, you can definitely Google it and see and look at how bad these reports and these things are. So anyway, my two cents. Okay, do you, want, do you have another question? Yes. <laughs> So um, first, thank you all. It was uh, very, very engaging. I have a last question. 
but maybe it's too broad and it doesn't really have an answer, but I just would like to, if you have anything that pops into your mind, just I would like to hear your opinion. So of course, when we speak about feminist foreign policy, we're speaking about, um, I mean, like uh, at least in the Swedish uh, case, the impression that I had it was that it was a state feminism in some ways, and uh, um, it, it could have been also instrumental. I'm not saying that this is the only reason, but like it may have been instrumental in proposing a certain like imaginary of a certain nation, and uh, Sweden as uh, this um, country reaching gender equality. Um, uh, I was wondering if do you think it's possible to move away from uh, when we speak about feminist foreign policy, if we can move away from like maybe uh, a, a state feminist perspective or like this nation state as the central actor of that and we can uh, maybe uh, rethink other actors uh, or like maybe just have a make an imaginative effort beyond uh, uh, the state nations that we have because uh, Sometimes I feel that it's very, uh, then I end up in this uh, trap of pragmatism. Uh, and sometimes it's nice to just to have, uh, I don't know, broaden the horizon and imagine uh, what would be like feminist foreign policy if we would not have the state, national state form in these terms of like what kind of reality we would like to, which kind of relations, international relations or transnational relations or like. Will the nation stay? I don't know. Let me I get all the... <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, I think that's a very, very good question too. And I think you bake in like a few questions. They're all super interesting. And the first being like, whether this is in instrumental or not. And in some ways, right, if it is foreign policy, we'll be instrumentalized in some ways. But I think foreign policy is, is a number of different things too. So my eye is twitching. Um, so it's not, you know, you, you have all these different agencies that kind of have different purposes and do different things. So I would also encourage you to think of the state in more disaggregated terms because it's not one beast. It doesn't work as a united thing, right? We think of states that way, but like, I'm increasingly convinced that it's much more fragmented and the practices disconnect sometimes, right? And I think the nation branding you're talking about, that's most evident maybe in public diplomacy where you have, you know, like the Swedish Institute and they're promoting like this image of Sweden. You talk about Sweden as a unit and Swedish culture as if it's one homogeneous thing. And right, they really mask over like the inequalities within Sweden or, you know, all the gender inequalities within Sweden, like those sorts of things, right? But when you look at other practices, if you look at Swedish development practice, for instance, that does in some sense, right, try to integrate civil society organizations, women's movements, both within Sweden, they work closely, I think, with the, you know, lots of Swedish civil society organizations. Not, you know, it's not a partnership, but there is some integrating of their perspectives. And same thing, I think, on the ground, you know, Swedish embassies work in different countries. They do try to do some work, right? It's still state-centric, but they do in some ways try to liaise with, right, like women's organizations in different parts of the world. So I think it looks quite different, like depending on where you go. But in terms of foreign policy, I don't think that is going to move away from states because it's what states do in their fragmented way, right? So if we want something else, it's going to have to be kind of civil society networks and like movements that move beyond state actors, I think. Mm. Uh, Ulrika, do you want to add anything? Yes, maybe I can just add uh, from actually my uh, my new hat or my present hat uh, working for you in women. Um, I think in in the United Nations and also uh, especially in you and women, there has been attempts, right, to to see the multilateral system not just as uh, states coming together or governments coming together, but trying to um, include civil society actors, private actors, academia, and trying to see kind of a new multilateral way of working. I'm not saying it's succeeded, or, uh, but there has been attempts like uh, the UN Women Generation Equality Initiative 
was done like that, that it was supposed to be governments, uh, civil society actors, academia, private actors coming together in coalitions, working on different uh, gender equality issues. And there is thinking on that in, in the United Nations and in different processes, seeing you know multilateral international issues more of a uh, diverse than just being the, the normal state actors. But so I think it's a valid question and, and probably things are changing in, in some direction. But of course, when it comes to government policies, it is government and it will be the national policies. But just to add that, thank you. Well, I think we have come to the end. So if anybody of you want to add anything, the panelists, I mean, because the time is running. Uh, no, pretty. Uh, May Ma I? Ma yes. yes, thank you so much. Um, I, I think, first of all, I want to thank for this important and interesting session in which we could share our problems around the feminist foreign policy, because this is something that we are building. And of course, you, Sweden, of Swedish people, you have a lot of experience, but uh, we need to try to build now how with the changes in the governments, we need to have some care how those policies are becoming permanent and not only something that is dependent on the, on the government. And this is very difficult, but not impossible but we need to look. And I think for this, the UN agencies and UN women has a lot of responsibility in helping the uh, feminist groups in the national, uh, at national level to be working on that and supporting some areas in the government. And of course, developing a, a concept and, and about this in all the uh, population in order to be able to, uh, con to have a continuity because this is something that we need to consider. How to make it possible to continue with the changes in the government. And this is something that we need to build up and make your experience is going to be guiding again as, as it do as before. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. Uh, do you want to say a last word uh, for me? Oh, sorry, um, I was on mute. Yes, um, I just want um, to thank um, each and every one of you um, um, for interesting um, discussion, like really getting from experts, from um, people from the academic um, sphere, from the, um, from the um, NGOs and from other communities, um, and really understanding the nuances and all the approaches and um, all the thoughts um, regarding the feminist um, policy and um, really thinking of how um, we in um, or myself in my in, an organi in my organization can really push the agenda of the feminist policy and really see how we can actually address um, these kinds of issues in our communities. Okay, thank you for me, and I really want to thank everybody for accepting to be part of this panel and uh, to made this conversation very interesting. And uh, as I said before, this is being recorded. So we will have that uh, hopefully in YouTube and the, the channel of uh, Galibi YouTube. And we will try to text it as well to other languages so we can spread it out. But uh, thank you for tonight. And I hope to see you sometime in the future. Okay. Thank you.